Hi there and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to have Jamie Edwards with us today. Jamie is the CEO of Cloudbreak Health. Uh, came to, to be here today talking with you because of a conversation on Twitter, as always, um, that I had with, with Nick Atkins, who, who um, runs a Pink Socks movement. So can you explain a little bit about the Pink Socks movement? And I think there's a lot of parallels and crossovers between what we're doing here with Access Chat and some of the stuff that's happening with Pink Socks. And then we can go into the cloud break story and find out more about the good work you're doing there. Sure. Uh, Nick will do the Pink Socks movement a lot more justice than I will, but I'll try and step into his kilt and uh, military boots and, and see if I can do as good a job. Um, Nick started the Pink Socks movement largely as um, a little bit of just a, a, a genuine, um, genuine spirit of gifting. And uh, it started because Nick was a you know, suit and tie healthcare executive who one day went to Burning Man. And in Burning Man, he experienced, you know, went through all the different um, stages of, of, of climatization and came out on the other side, a, a changed guy with a different mission. And he was a, um, you know, besides then, you know, going from wearing pants to wearing a kilt, um, Nick, Nick was still a healthcare executive and he worked for a startup. And he was at the HIMSS conference, which is one of the largest conferences for health IT in the world. And, um, you know, he had a friend who had a sock company and his friend had given him this pair of pink socks with mustaches on it. And he started handing them out. And he, you know, it's just the spirit of gifting that again, he had learned at Burning Man. Um, so it, the thing kind of took on a life of its own. And eventually healthcare leaders from across the world would run into Nick because he's, you know, this, this loving, open guy who would walk up to you and, and strike a, up a conversation. And at the end of the conversation, he'd say something like, you know, you're awesome, I'm awesome, I'm gonna give you these socks, have a great day. And it literally changed people's perspective. And so the pink socks movement started to take shape and, you know, healthcare leaders like Jerome Toss from Phillips, um, Jonathan Bush from Athena Health and others, Eric Topol, um, all were wearing these socks around and they became this great conversation starter. And so you'd be walking around these conferences and people would say, hey, so you're wearing pink socks. And it, all of a sudden you felt like you were, you know, uh, you had this common ground that wasn't there before. And so, you know, Nick would tell you, look, pink socks are what they are to you. Um, the meaning that you derive from them is a very personal thing. For me, it was been about healthcare innovation, um, you know, being open to uh, building relationships with other people who you more normally might not, just being generally more accepting. I think we all lead life from a little bit of a jaded perspective. You know, we're always on our guard, always protecting. And so for us, the Pink Socks movement was the antithesis of that. It was like, instead, we're going to approach everyone with a little bit of love and a lot of openness. And um, now there's 10 over, you know, I think it, the number is 10,000 pairs of socks um, have been circulated worldwide. And if you actually map them out, it, it really covers the globe. So it's been a, a pretty amazing thing. And we actually at our company, you know, we'll hand them out to people when we're at conferences and, you know, nothing, expecting nothing back. It's just a, a chance to brighten someone's day. Fantastic. I, I think that that was the thing that really attracted me. It was a sense of openness and, and willingness to engage with people in a very accepting way that that, yep. that attracted me. And that's something that we've tried to do with, with Access Chat. Um, we want to create a community of people that want to change change the world to, in a much in a very positive way. So um, that's why I first approached Nick, and he said, "Hey, come and speak to Jamie. He's doing good stuff." So tell us about the good stuff that you're doing with Cloudbreak, and and and, and what it is, and 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 a bit more about telehealth because I think this is a really important topic. Yeah, Cloudbreak is a unified telemedicine company, and what that means is we bring together all of the different healthcare specialties onto a single platform, in many cases onto a single device. It's available on PC, iOS, or Android. Um, and in, today we're in 700 hospitals across the country. And the genesis of how Cloudbreak got started was actually as a language interpretive service company in healthcare. So helping limited English proficient and deaf and hard of hearing patients 
um, communicate with their providers at you know one of the most scary times of their life when they're in a hospital. You can imagine that being in a hospital in the States is scary enough when you speak English and they're speaking their doctor talk. Um, but when you don't speak English, it's absolutely terrifying. People running around your bed, shouting things in a foreign language. Um, and the stories that come out of the use of the platform every day are amazing. And so as we grew the company over the course of the last few years, we realized a few things. One, we had built one of the largest private broadband networks into healthcare in the country. So all of our hospitals are connected to us over our private broadband network. Um, we had built a very robust video contact center that allowed us to route a call to the right resource at the right time. And then we had these hospitals that were on the network, again, almost 700 hospitals as, a, as the count is today, performing over 75,000 encounters a month. And those encounters now include not only language services, but things like telestroke, things like telepsych, um, new applications like telesitting. Literally, there's thousands of different use cases for the platform. And so our goal as a company has been to really improve access in healthcare. And we were talking a little bit before the show about this concept of inclusion. Well, our goal is to have everyone included in the healthcare system um, in, a, in a way that is really productive for them. And um, that led to our mission, which is to humanize healthcare. And, you know, a lot of people say, how can you use technology to humanize healthcare? We do it because our technology helps build connections between people and we can help increase access to healthcare for someone who previously might not have been able to make it to a hospital to finally receive their care. Um, for an, a limited English, a Spanish speaking patient who's undergoing a trying procedure to finally be able to understand what their provider is saying to them and really empower the patient to take better control care of themselves and empower the physician to actually make the proper diagnosis. Because uh, prior to having services like ours in place, uh, they weren't really able to do that. So they spent a lot of money on unnecessary testing. Uh, there was very low patient satisfaction as a result. Outcomes were worse. So we really see telemedicine being at the, the crux of helping solve a lot of problems for inclusion and access and quality. Yeah, that's great. So I know Deborah's got a question, so I'm going to hand over to Deborah. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Jamie, thank you for being on the program. We, um, I, I'm really in awe of what you're doing. I have a, a woman that works for my company. Her name is Rosemary Musashio, and Rosemary um, sustained an injury at birth, and so she has uh, cerebral palsy. And one of the things that she has is she doesn't have the ability to talk. She can she can vocalize noises, but she cannot speak. And so she uses a communications device and. She has had so many problems with yeah. being in a hospital over the years. It's been horrible, and she she's actually written quite a bit about it. And so I, I think what you're doing is, is just so powerful. And I have a lot of questions, but one of the questions that I would have for you, Jamie, is um, why did you get into this? To, I would be curious immediately of, I mean, because you're, you're making a huge difference, Jamie. So I, I why? You know, it's, making such a difference. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's a great question. Um, one, I want to thank you guys for having me, being able to engage in these types of very important discussions and get the word out about healthcare disparities that exist is, you know, again, a primary mission of what we do. So the opportunity to sit down and actually engage in this discussion is an amazing thing for us to, to do. And so I'm grateful for that. Um, you know, my path of getting into this is actually quite windy. Um, I had always done mission driven things when I was younger. I was a camp counselor um, at a, a special camp for kids with cancer. Um, I was always doing community service type of work. Um, but when I was in undergrad, uh, I took a course in entrepreneurship and I realized the power of being able to take an idea and make it real and have it, you know, build into something that has meaning. So from my perspective, um, what I ended up doing was starting to write a bunch of business plans and I realized that my finance skill set was very weak. And so I actually went into investment banking so that I could build this accounting skill set and this finance skill set so I could get my ideas financed at the end of the day. And I, I would never be beholden to a CFO who was talking all this financial speak and I couldn't understand it. Um, so a, a main goal of what I was trying to do was build a competency. And so for the first 10 years of my career, I was an investment banker and I worked in private equity guy and I worked on about $8 billion of transactions. I was actually at Lehman Brothers in the communications and media group. And um, back in, you know, 2000, 
2004 and five, I started doing a little consulting for someone who's my uncle. And I come from a family of physicians. My sister is a physician. My brother-in-law is a physician. My father-in-law is a physician. <laughs> my aunts and uncles on both sides are doctors. So I've always been around healthcare in one way, shape, or form. And my uncle, Dr. Irv Edwards, one of the first guys to come out of an ER residency when it first became a specialty back in the 70s. And he eventually tried to start his own ER company. And so he got his own contract and started building it. Um, back in 2005, I started doing some consulting for him. And I brought him out of his home office and built, you know, helped him you know, have a real office. And I built a lot of his infrastructure in Excel and PowerPoint. You know, it was easy for me to impress my physician uncle with all those investment banking skills that you built. But I taught him about EBITDA and cash flow and revenue and all these different types of things. And one day he said, Jamie, the company's growing. I'd like you to come and join us full time as the CEO. So I left what at the time was a very good investment banking job with a lot of great momentum. This was in 2006 before things, uh, you know, obviously went the other way in seven and eight. And um, against the advice of all my mentors, I went to work for a small ER group in Southern California called Emergent Medical Associates. Um, and when I joined the group, it was, you know, a small company and seeing, you know, 50, 60,000 patients a year. And when I left about 10 years ago, I mean, left 10 years later, um, the group was seeing a million patients a year. Uh, we were doing wow. ER anesthesia and hospitalist medicine. And I, you know, one of the great things for me was I shadowed our doctors on the front line of healthcare every day. And I made sure my teams did too. So if you're working in the back office, you rotated through doing shifts in an emergency department. So you could actually see the work you know, because sometimes it's hard to connect the dots. So I made sure everyone did the rotations. Um, and it was, it, it was you know, interesting for me. I got to see healthcare from the ground up and see the challenges that were faced, not only by patients, but by providers as well. And being a provider in our country is not an easy thing. Being a physician is a very difficult thing and patients don't have a lot of compassion for them. So back in 2008, um, the ER company um, made an investment or actually a control group from the ER company did in a company called the Language Access Network, which was the predecessor company to Cloudbreak Health. And um, we proceeded to you know, grow Language Access Network. And at the time, it was a distressed business that was about to go bankrupt and we turned it around. Um, they were about to run out of cash when they came to uh, meet with us. And I really believed in what they were doing. And the founder, Andy Panos, had a great message. And he had a very pure heart in terms of what he was trying to do. He wanted to solve communication problems for limited English proficient patients. And the reason that he wanted to do that is because he had been in Mexico. His brother had been in a car accident. And he was unable to communicate with the provider. And you know, his brother was actually pronounced dead, even though he wasn't. Wow. Right? There were things like that that happened. Things that I'm sure Rosemary, your friend, faces right? every time she goes to a healthcare facility. Because communication is the number one diagnostic tool a, a, a physician has. And when you can't communicate, you know, uh, poor outcomes, poor quality, decreased access, all of those things happen. And so this became a mission and I ended up raising money for Language Access Network in 2000, uh, 2015. So we you know, worked on the company for six years, getting it well positioned. And uh, when we raised money, I went to work at the company full time. I left my job at EMA to go work on this you know, much smaller startup because I really believed in the mission. And we had grown EMA to the point where you know, a different type of management was required because it wasn't growing as quickly. It was now, how do you manage this big organization? And I'm the idea guy. I like to build things. Um, so I, I left to go build Language Access Network. We rebranded it as Cloudbreak as we started to become this unified telemedicine company. And um, you know the stories that come out of the use of the platform every day are pretty amazing. Patients who, un who weren't understood before, who now felt understood, who now felt valued, who can now engage in their care. Um, lives being saved on the Telestroke platform. Um, you know, uh, better care being had because of the telepsychiatrist. So um, it's been really gratifying. But again, a windy road. <laughs> No, but, and I'm going to turn the mic over to Antonio, but I just want to make a comment that um, since we're a global chat, that yeah. Jamie is in the United States. So uh, along with me, uh, I, ju I just want to make that. And then um, um, Antonio or Neil, I, I can't. 
Yeah, my accent didn't give it away, right? I mean, I, I work out of California. Our, our office, our, our company has an office throughout the uh, throughout the United States, and we are looking at some international opportunities in um, Canada, Thailand, and Japan right now. But uh, we are now pretty much solely focused on the U.S. Yeah, we need you, Antonio. So, Jamie, in this you know, experience, you know. Uh, dealing with doctors, with patients, uh, implementing technology in, in healthcare, uh, you know, there's a, a strong element of change. You know, people need to change the way how they work, the way how they communicate. Can you tell us about um, how you were able to implement that change in terms of how the doctors uh, are working with patients in the way our patients say, oh, now there's a technology here that we can use. Uh, can you tell us about that journey and what you do to make your system a, a, success, a success case? Yeah, you guys are keying in on all the right issues. So in healthcare today, especially when it comes to technology, I would hazard a guess that most physicians would tell you technology hasn't helped them. It's intermediated the care between them and their patients. You know, instead of me looking at you at the camera and talking to you, Antonio, I'd be documenting in the electronic medical record over here and not making eye contact, right? Um, and so this big revolution that was supposed to happen because of electronic medical records didn't necessarily or hasn't yet been the panacea that everyone thought it was going to be. Um, we haven't been able to mine that data the way that we thought artificial intelligence will hopefully help with those types of things. Um, but what it's done is it's led to a cultural challenge when you're asking physicians to adopt new technologies. And let's face it, most of the physicians in the market have been practicing for 10, 20, 30 years, and they've practiced a very specific way during that time period. So they have a lot of embedded synapse, you know, synapses firing, saying do it in a specific way. So what we do as a company is we actually have cultural change agents that we call client advocates. And when we go do an implementation, we deploy these client advocates into the field and their job is to help change the behaviors of the physicians, change the behaviors of the x-ray techs who have said, you know what, I've practiced this way for a certain period of time. I don't need your stinking telemedicine or I like working with this interpreter. Um, I don't need to have ready access to your interpreters. So one of the things that we did is we deploy these people and they literally sit there and they round on the equipment to make sure it's in good working order. So when someone hits the button, right, the system works the way that it should. We've made the system as easy to use as possible so that it can really drive adoption. So we've been very focused on user interface and look and feel and making sure that we've adapted to the physician's workflow as opposed to making the physician adapt to ours. But a lot of it is just repetitive training and in-servicing around letting them know that the system is there. Because in most technologies, what you'll see when you drop the technology off at the door and say, hey, we've done your initial training, it's great, use it, is there'll be a lot of usage in the beginning and then it slowly starts to tail off as people revert back to their mean behavior or their average behavior, like what they're used to. So what we do is we continually reinforce the new behavior to make sure that it levels off or in fact grows. And in fact, at all of our client partners, if you take a look at the minute packages they initially bought from us, they are all growing. They started at 5,000 minutes. Now they're doing 40,000 minutes a month of different telemedicine services. And it's because we've been able to show them that this creates value and that it makes their lives easier. And doctors in particular, typically what I learned at my previous job at EMA is that they needed to be managed by other physicians. But the other thing I learned is that they respond to data and they respond to something very tangible because Doctors in the United States, it's all about practicing evidence-based medicine. So you have to show them the evidence and show them how this can make their lives better. And that's what we've really been effective in doing is showing them not only how it can improve their own lives, but improve the lives of their patients. And doctors at the end of the day, they care about their patients and they want to do what's right for them. Uh, you were mentioned that you have people in the field. Something that mm -hmm. I was also interested is in the, the, your approach to the design of the platform, because I'm sure you have doctors from different ages, you know, who, you know, who like to do things in a different way. You may not have you no know, doctors who are colorblind, dyslexic, uh, uh, who might struggle to use the platform. Can you tell us your approach to the design uh, of the platform? Yeah, our approach is one button. Right, trying to make things as easy for people as we can. So if you, instead of trying to do things in three or four steps, can we do it in one step? It's about reducing the burden on the person using the technology. So the technology eventually fades into the background, right? Like the great things about 
these devices is they're super intuitive. Now, I think the interesting thing is like my, you know, when my kids were two and three, they understood this immediately. My grandmother is still learning it, right? <laughs> um, but uh, I think, you know, it's all about ease of use. And I'm a, I, I'm a design thinking disciple. I went to the design thinking boot camp at Stanford and learned from the folks at IDEO. So I'm a big believer in trying to design products people actually love to use, right? And have them engage with it. One of the big complaints about telemedicine today is the patient engagement rates are low. And I think that's because a lot of the healthcare platforms have designed by have been designed by IT people instead of by doctors, physicians, and patients. And so we try and engage the community when we're designing our products so that um, we're designing something that is easy to use. You know, I'll, I'll even say beautiful to look at if you look at our interfaces. We come from the mantra of why can't healthcare be fun? Right? We're a little bit edgier than other healthcare companies with our marketing and the things that we do because I feel like there's all this momentum around or inertia and in, ma in maintaining the status quo in healthcare. And our goal is really to pop, you know, blow the doors off that and change it and get people thinking differently. Why can't we love going to the doctor, right? I mean, think about that concept for a second. Who and who loves going to see their physician? I mean, for me, it's a meeting with a, with a great person who can give me great advice. So why can't we all take that when we go to see our doctors? Instead, we have anxiety where, where we don't wanna go when we wait in the doctor's office, like I can't believe this physician is keeping me waiting. Well, if patients had a little bit more compassionate for what their you know, compassion for what their physicians were going through, and they understood that you know, hey, that doctor was late because he was seeing a patient who was just diagnosed with terminal cancer and took an extra took some extra time out of my appointment so that he could spend time explaining everything that they need, making sure all their questions were answered, and be a compassionate doctor. I think our ideas as patients would change. But instead, because of things like some of the regulatory laws like HIPAA, you know, the doctor can't say that to us. So what happens? We could, they come into our appointment after doing something really good for somebody else and they get negative reinforcement. We're like, well, I can't believe you kept me waiting. Um, you know, those are some of the difficulties in the healthcare system that we're trying to, trying to get out of it. Yeah, that, that's great. So um, I, I'm really interested in, in the potential of, of remote healthcare because I, I, I see, one of the things that affects the community of people with disabilities is, well, there, there are a number of things. Firstly, um, mobility is an issue for, for a large Absolutely. number of people. So um, the ability to actually get to the doctors to, to get help, to have those conversations is limited. So, so you're, you're, you're solving that problem. Um, then another, another area where um, I think it's really underestimated the impact is the impact of design. Right, so you've got people with uh, learning difficulties and, and and conditions like myself with dyslexia, where actually the online processes are so bad that you don't get an appointment either. Right, so right. you know you've got two-factor authentication, sometimes three or four-factor authentication before you can even get access to the appointments. By which point they're all gone, and so you don't get the appointment. So that has actually got an impact. I wonder how much of that is actually playing into the fact that people with um with learning disabilities die earlier yeah yeah so, so yeah. access to an easy way to go and get advice where you can talk to someone i think is 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 of paramount importance i'm really pleased because actually this this times really well because um today is the first day that as an employee of of, of my employer atos Certainly in the UK, we have access to telemedicine. Oh, nice! Yeah. So, so we have we've we've got uh, access to a GP, um, with limited calls, but every employee gets at least three, <sighs> you know, virtual trips to the doctor every year. That's great. You know, because we're a, uh, a you know a distributed organisation. We all work from home, and and actually in the UK, although the healthcare is free, it's still really hard to get an appointment. Right. It's still really hard to fit it around work. So I'm I'm seeing that, that you're you're you know at the forefront of the wave of, of what's coming. Um, so you, you mentioned that you're uh, doing you're, you're consulting patients and you're consulting the the, the doctors and, uh, and everything else. What do you see as the sort of next steps in in, in patient engagement? Because obviously you know 
a lot i've just mentioned people with learning difficulties but you have an aging population that are not necessarily digital natives that are finding it yes. harder how do you, you you don't have the opportunity to go into patients homes and show them the system how do you drive adoption with the patients yeah, so that's actually interesting. We very much started off as an e-consult hospital-based model. Um, at the American Telemedicine Association conference two or three months ago, we launched our e-visit platform um, so that we actually could do um, at-home health visits. And we're pairing that with um, wearables and patient monitoring tools. You can actually deploy kits. You know, you had mentioned mobility. If you take a look at a lot of the closed healthcare systems in the United States, Kaiser Permanente, the Veterans Administration, um, those systems have deployed telemedicine um, in huge, huge ways, doing more of their visits in telemedicine than they are in person. Right? There was just a recent stat that came out that said Kaiser had, I think, done 54% of their visits as telemedicine visits versus um, in, in person visits. And when you think about that, the whole place based nature of telemedicine is changing, and the four walls of the hospital are breaking down. And what we're seeing the evolution of is something that we've called at CloudBreak branded care networks. Right? It's, it's about taking your existing continuum of care, Neil, and enabling it with telemedicine. That okay. is the model that we think wins the day. There are a lot of companies out there, and there's a, there's a place for it, um, but there are a lot of companies out there who are creating a new continuum of care. There was a study that the RAND group came out with, and they had taken a look at some Blue Cross Blue Shield patients that worked with Teladoc as an example. And the study came out and said, telemedicine increases the use of inpatient visits. That's not true, right? It, it's true in that scenario because that wasn't my doctor. So what am I gonna do after I have my telemedicine visit? And by the way, what's that doctor on the other end gonna do as part of good protocol? He's gonna say, follow up with your primary care physician or follow up with your pediatrician, right? Because the continuum of care is really important. So what we've tried to do as a company is enable that existing continuum of care so that, you know, Neil and Deborah and Antonio can all go to their existing physicians using telemed. And that's really the point of our home health platform. And we're now one of the only platforms in the world that can actually follow a patient all the way from home to the hospital and back again on the same platform using the same backend technologies, being part of the same network. And what it means for hospitals in the United States is typically a hospital would work with company A for telepsych, company B for telestroke, company C for home health. And so you couldn't bring the full weight of that institution to bear around a patient as their care team and say, hey, you know what? I'd like to bring on someone from our cardiology team because they're on different platforms. So our system was built around breaking down those barriers and on letting someone say, hey, you know what? I'd like to bring in a nutritionist. I'd like to bring in so-and-so into this discussion because I think it would be helpful for you. And at the click of the button, bringing in someone from the care team to do that. Great. I know Deborah's got a comment she wants to make yeah you know one thing that i've noticed um it's always interesting getting the perspective of you know what is healthcare like in the U united kingdom and in europe yeah, and canada absolutely. and and as you know jamie uh, things are it is so complicated right now in the united states my husband uh is just turned 65 and went on medicaid and yep I'm a relatively intelligent woman, but I'm telling you, it is so confusing. So then you take the complication of, like you said, all the moving parts and the nutritionist and the, it, it is very, very confusing. And then you take yep. somebody that isn't speaking the language proficiently or, you know, maybe has a thick accent or once again, like Rosemary, cannot speak in a traditional manner and it gets very complicated and I think you're right a lot of mistakes can be made so I, I'm really really impressed with the work that you're doing I I mean not only is it very valuable the physicians and the patients but you've got to be saving lives and saving people so much money so you've become my new hero Jamie I'm very impressed with what you're doing I'm so glad we're having you today well, I appreciate that, but uh, you know, there's a lot of people doing great work in this country, and uh, I, I am no hero. I'm 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 just someone who's you know trying to get you know the message out and put a platform out there that again that people want to use, and all of the resulting great things that happen from it. You know, getting the interpreters, getting these physicians to the point right, of care right. um, are so powerful. But at the end of the day, if you if you take a look at it, um, we have so much. You, know, you mentioned other company. I mean, other countries. 
other countries have better healthcare systems than the United States. The stats show it out. You know, the WHO has all the statistics to show that we're ranked, you know, X in infant mortality, and but we spend Y on care. So we, the U.S. spends more on care pretty much than any other country in the world, but we don't have the best care as it's generally measured. Now, gr- amazing care is available. The best care is available. But if you measure the system on a whole, um, it's not there. And I think, you know, when we take a look at healthcare, you had mentioned the nutritionist and everyone, right? It takes a village. And right now we are much more focused on sick care than we are on well care. And if the healthcare system is really working appropriately, not that many people are going to hospitals, right? <laughs> um, well, that's, and you know that's what? It's also, yeah, you know what? I, I a couple of things I want to say. I, we recently, just as a family in the United States, I have a daughter with Down syndrome or trisomy twenty one. My husband's having some issues that we're having to deal with, and. Um, it, it, it is so confusing to navigate. And I agree with you. We focus in the United States on sick care as opposed to keeping us healthy. And my doctor, one of my doctors retired, went and found another wonderful doctor. She left and started practicing concierge medicine, which is great if you have money in the U.S., but it's very complicated. I think it's going to get worse. And I don't want to just complain about the U.S. because I know there's so many wonderful things about the U.S., but the work you're doing – it really is beautiful because it's really focused on the patient and us understanding each other. Like you said, I have a doctor now that he spends a lot of time with each patient. And as I'm waiting, I think, but I know I'm going to get that same care. So I'm going to be patient and I'm, you know, so I appreciate the time he takes with me. And I also, as you said, understand sometimes he might be having a very difficult, you know, uh, conversation with another patient. So I can yeah. be, very patient and understanding and thankful for the time when it comes to me. But I know we're almost out of the time. So let me turn it over to you, Neil. And it, and as you know, it is about the patient's journey. It is as Antonio wrote in the uh, comment box. So yep. we're very grateful for you, Jamie. Yeah. No, we're grateful. I, again, grateful to have the discussion. So, so um, before I close, I, I just got a, a, a couple of comments. Um, we, we're doing you're doing great stuff and i'm really interested in how you can bring together the various different disparate silos how do you think we can go to the next step which is to connect those silos or or break them open globally because actually we've got a huge amount of knowledge and people are moving around a lot you know people are moving from country to country uh, healthcare records don't move with them how do you think that we can take that to the next step and 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 not have a uh, you know a localized health system because even in the uk where it's we have a national health service there's localized health authorities localized mm-hmm. records and uh, not everything is connected as it should be you know so how what's your vision for let's end with your vision for you know a connected future yeah, you know, I think it's interesting. You, you mentioned breaking down the silos. What that really is is interoperability, right? That's the that's the word that we all all use to discuss that. And right now, I don't think there's a lot of incentive for EMR companies to let people make it easy to you know take the data out of that system, like because they see a lot of value in it. They feel like that's you know, the more data they get into their platform, the more valuable they become. And these are big companies. Yeah. Um, I think there is work that Epic and Cerner and McKesson, you know, that they're all doing to try and do that, but Honestly, I think some sort of government, you know, treaty between countries saying this is how we're going to share data because that type of stuff doesn't exist today, right? If if I travel to the UK, it's a totally different system than the US, which is a totally different system than Canada, and my information doesn't go with me. So in this person-centered healthcare world that's evolving, what we would like to see happen is this concept of a precision care team that follows you around wherever it is. You know, people have been talking about the Precision Medicine Initiative. For us, and you know, something we're looking at actually trademarking is what we're calling precision care teams. And the idea behind a precision care team is you are a unique individual and you have unique needs, unique comorbidities, and um, you know, your DNA is just different. And so can we use that DNA? Can we use the issues that you're facing to construct a care team that's available for you? So if you are someone who has congestive heart failure, um, diabetes, and X, Y, and Z syndrome, can we put a care team on a telemedicine app for you that at the push of a button, everyone there has access to your care records. 
everyone there knows what your situation is and they can give you the appropriate advice because going to you know a nutritionist who might not be an expert in your specific condition doesn't mean they're going to give you that the you know the right foods to eat for your specific situation because if they knew that you had x they might tell you to eat something different right so all those different things are coming to play we refer to that as a precision care team and we think that's where the future of medicine is it's in you getting the right care for exactly your needs that's that's fantastic love that thank you very much it's been it's been really fascinating chatting with you uh we look forward to you joining us on twitter tomorrow night uh, i look forward to it as well again really grateful for the time and uh, this has been an engaging discussion on healthcare disparities and the like and the future of healthcare. and uh you know anytime you guys want to have it again i'm game <laughs> great okay okay thank you bye-bye okay. bye-bye